online. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and we're very pleased to welcome you to Saving Paradise and the Ponderosa Way Fire Break with Gray Brecken and Stephen J. Pine. If you're new to the Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we're still one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature a general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and our cinema lit film series. So please visit our website to get all of our listings. Uh, the talk will be followed by a Q&A. So if you have a chat question, please put it in the chat and we'll be reading off the questions to our speakers. And also books by the authors can be found at alexanderbook.com. So this year alone, wildfires have burned over 4 million acres throughout California, ravaging land, natural habitats, and thousands of homes and communities. Tonight, we have two experts to guide this conversation about past and present policies, practices, and funding that can protect our forests and our lives. Gray Brecken, scholar in residence at UC Berkeley, will talk about the historic importance of the Ponderosa Way. And this massive New Deal infrastructure project spanned 800 miles through California and employed thousands of workers during the Great Depression. It's overgrown and neglected, and we wonder, could it be revitalized today? Also, could it have saved paradise from being raised to the ground? Also, fire historian uh, Stephen J. Pine offers his firsthand experience from years of wildland firefighting in the Grand Canyon with the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, he's one of the foremost authorities on fire throughout the US and has written many books, which I'll mention later. Uh, we look forward to these views on prevention, preservation, and practices as we face climate change and more erratic weather and fire patterns that are happening across the country. Uh, a few words about our speakers. Gray Brecken is founder of the Living New Deal, which promotes the history, sites, and projects of the New Deal and its relevance today. Gray regularly lectures around the country and is president of the New Deal, a nonprofit and of the nonprofit board of directors. Um, he is also the author of Imperial San Francisco, Urban Power, Earthly Ruin, and Farewell Promised Land, Waking from the California Dream. And Stephen J. Pine is Emeritus Professor at Arizona, Arizona State University. He's, he's here with us tonight from Alpine. And he is best known for his research into the history of fire and his publications are vast and include Between Two Fires, A Fire History of Contemporary America, California, A Fire Survey, and to the Last Smoke, an anthology, just to name a few. So please welcome Gray Brecken and Stephen Pine. And we're going to start off with Gray. Thank you, Laura. Let's see. Okay. Um, well, as Laura said, I want to talk to you about the Ponderosa Way. It's a fascinating artifact, um, but there'll be a lot else as well, too. And I just want to start with the Living New Deal, which is my project, actually. And um, it's a, a national team of um, associates. And what we're doing is identifying, mapping, and interpreting the total cumulative um, physical legacy left to us by the various New Deal agencies. Um, you can go to our website, it's very simple, livingnewdeal.org. And what we're doing is we're actually discovering a lost civilization, which just happens to be ours. Um, it was built about 85 years ago by my parents' generation. They forgot to tell us about it. Um, and so we're having to rediscover it. Um, it was essentially um, 
buried by its enemies and forgotten. And so nobody's ever done this before. So what we're doing, as I said, is mapping everything that the New Deal agencies left us. And this is our current map. It's just going to get denser and denser. Um, we now have about 16,500 points on it. But as I wrote recently in an article in our newsletter, we're just scratching the surface because we know that there are hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of sites to go. And so I know what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. And it makes me very happy to be involved in doing this kind of treasure hunt along with so many great people that we're involved with. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk about one of those agencies that left us lots of stuff, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. This was Franklin Roosevelt's own idea, his favorite of all of the agencies and one that he wanted to make permanent. Um, it also was the most popular. In its nine plus years of existence, it employed over 3 million young men. And here are just some archival photos of the men um, uh, playing and working. Uh, they did a lot of both. And what they did actually was um, they did a great deal of forest management. They did soil conservation. They uh, created recreational facilities. They stocked fish. Um, they did so much stuff. And they did this because, as I said, there were so many of them that it provided an enormous labor force. They were housed in uh, camps, usually way out in the boonies. Uh, each camp would have about 200 men. It would have an infirmary, library, uh, school facilities, um, mess hall, of course, and then bunk houses for the men. And um, uh, at its peak, there were over 4,000 of these camps all around the country. It's usually associated with the West, but as you can see, there were a lot of camps in the East as well, too, in the Adirondacks, the um, Appalachians. Um, they had a lot of work to do. And contrary to um, mythology that you hear all the time, the uh, CCC was at least partially racially integrated 15 years before Truman integrated the armed forces. And that is outside of the South where it was always segregated. They left us a lot of wonderful structures, um, those kind of rustic structures that we see in our state and our national parks. They left us a, a great heritage of stonework, magnificent stonework, which they learned from what were known as local experienced men who taught them how to do it. And they left us great amphitheaters as well too. This is the Red Rock Amphitheater just west of Denver. And this is the Mountain Theater up on uh, Mount Tamalpais where they did all the trails and the fire lookout, et cetera. Hey, hey. We're, not, we're not seeing your screen, Cher. Oh no. Oh yes. <laughs> Was I talking with that you've seen that? Yeah, we can't, we can't see the screen share. Just hit screen share. Huh? Can you see it now? Here we go. You can see it now. Uh, what we see is a we're seeing your something from you. You should be able to select um, the um, your uh, your keynote. Look for your keynote. You have to select your keynote. Can you see it now? Hold on, hang on, we're getting there. Yeah, we got, here we go, here we go. Now click back to the beginning so we can see it. So you weren't seeing any of that? No. No, let's start from the beginning. All right. Okay, here we go again. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna be a bit briefer because you've already had the text, um, but um, this is the Living New Deal, our webpage. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna go through it all again. As I said, we now have uh, over 16,000 sites and this is the lost civilization that we're discovering. And it had tends, it, it was ours actually. Um, this is the map on our um, website and um, it looks like a lot. 
as I said, it's about 16,500 sites, but um, when we're finished, you'll bar barely be able to see the United States because it's just so much. As I said in this article, we're just scratching the surface. So the CCC, this is a WPA poster of the CCC, and it lasted over nine years. And it, these are the men um, at work and at play. Um, the one in the upper right actually is men um, building an access road into Sequoia National Park. Oh, actually, so is the lower left as, as well too. So when you go into a national park, you're basically, you're usually riding on CCC roads and seeing CCC construction all over the place. This is one of the camps that had 200 men. And um, this is a map showing all of the camps in the United States. As I said, there were over 4,000 of them. And you can see how many of them there are on the East Coast. So it's not just the West. This is a very interesting photograph that shows that the camps were actually at least partially racially segregated outside of the South 15 years before the armed forces were integrated. And these are some of the uh, things that they left us. These are, uh, this is actually the rustic structures up at Sequoia National Park. Um, this is a ranger station in Salem, Oregon, the kind of stonework that they did, Red Rock Amphitheater, and the Mountain Theater up on Mount Tamalpais. And as I was saying, they planted a lot of trees. Um, the CCC planted over 3 billion trees in its nine plus years of existence. So when you think of what we need to plant now, uh, well, it suggests exactly the kind of labor force that we need to do that kind of work. So it's not just that they fought fires, they actually were um, creating entire forests. They're actually uh, in the United States, uh, we know that they're entire forests that are now about 85 years old that the CCC planted at the time. Well, it was largely created because of the Great Depression. As you may know, at that time, the unemployment rate was about 25%, but for young people, it was much higher. And for African-Americans, it was higher still. So this is one of the uh, uh, FSA photographs of a young man in despair. Um, and something that was said at the time, I have moments of real terror when I think we might be losing this generation. Um, we have to bring these young people into the active life of the community and make them feel that they are necessary. That person was Eleanor Roosevelt. And it was a very real fear that, um, that we were leaving, losing an entire generation. Well, you can see the same site um, in full color on any of our city streets now. Um, this is now personalized depression. The economy may be doing good for some, or great, but in fact, it's not. That there are people all over the place that are suffering personalized depression or if you like, wasted potential. So this is actually Eleanor Roosevelt with young men who, whose potential was being realized. They were very fortunate because they were stationed at a camp in Yosemite Valley. So um, they probably felt that they had died and gone to heaven, um, especially if they'd come from the hollers of Kentucky or the Dust Bowl to work in this magnificent place and make it even more so. Uh, this is one of the CCC boys. He just passed away. Walter was 98 when he died and he was a CCC boy. And like so many of the CCCs, um, he said that it was one of the happiest times of his life and it set him up for success later on in life. He's standing next to a statue that our sister organization, the National um, New Deal Preservation Association hopes to um, have installed in every state in the union. Actually, several states have several of these. And it's a reminder of what we owe these young men from back then. Walter was head of the CCC Alumni Association for a number of years, um, and most of those men are now gone. Um, you can actually see them in action. You can go to the movies um, because our website has a section of digitized New Deal movies, and there are a number of them uh, that show the CCC in action. So get yourself some popcorn and go and enjoy the movies. All right, the Ponderosa Way is um, this remarkable fire break 
or fuel break, which I first learned about, um, oh, probably 15 years ago when visiting my friend, uh, Ranger, um, Jordan Fisher Smith, who was on this call up in Nevada City. He told me about this and I thought, that's amazing. I've never heard of it, but it runs very close to Nevada City and Grass Valley. Um, and then I became increasingly interested as I realized the connection with the Civilian Conservation Corps. Unfortunately, nobody else I knew had ever heard of this thing, including people who should have known about it. I wrote an op-ed um, and could not get it placed. And so, um, yeah, I wrote the op-ed actually at the time of the campfire three years ago when paradise burned because I found that the Ponderosa Way had gone right through paradise. And if it hadn't been able to stop the fire, it might've at least provided an alternative evacuation route for the people, some of whom didn't make it out. So because nobody knew about it and I couldn't get my op-ed placed, uh, my friend Carol Denny actually did this cartoon for a local paper of ours in Berkeley about uh, how could we have forgotten something that big and dramatic? Well, the Ponderosa Way was kind of the obverse of the great shelter belts that were built by the CCC and other agencies in the Midwest uh, during the 1930s, which were meant to anchor the soil, conserve the soil and break the wind out there. So here they added trees in the Ponderosa Way, they subtracted them. And here are some of the boys working on it. Now the question here, and I hope to talk about this with Stephen, is should we call this a fire break or a fuel break? Because we now know with our um, ember driven fires that uh, great wildfires like we've seen in the last few years can jump um, wide freeways. Um, and so even the, the Ponderosa Way could not have done that. But I like to refer to them as fuel breaks because if it's not wind driven in that way, it will serve to um, slow down the fire, both for the firefighters themselves and for the people and animals that are in the way who need to get out of the way of the advancing fire front. Well, as I said, I couldn't get anybody to do this story, not in the Chronicle or the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times as, as California was burning last summer. So um, I just um, sent it out to some of the reporters who were covering the fire so well at the Chronicle and uh, Matthias Gaffney picked it up and he did what I think is a Pulitzer Prize winning job. It appeared in November 15th on the front page of the Chronicle uh, and then uh, two jump pages on the inside with great graphics. He really did his research. This is one of the graphics uh, from it. And I urge you to actually go to the digital version because it has graphics that they didn't have room for in the print version. So this shows how the um, Ponderosa Way went from the Kern River in the south near Bakersfield up to the Pitt River in the north near Mount Shasta. And it went, it went along the um, uh, foothills of the Sierra. You can see here on the right how many counties it went through. I think it goes through 16 counties. So, um, and there was some archival documents in the uh, digital version of Matthias's article. And this is actually a photograph um, from Stephen's collection. And it shows something very interesting. You can see the, how the Ponderosa Way goes through the lower foothills. It goes through grasslands and brush, brushy areas. And it's meant to actually serve as a wall to protect the valuable timber at the top of that ridge up there so that it can't get up there. But it, it's really going through this kind of scrubby land down below. Now, it's very difficult to find pictures of the Ponderosa Way when it was young and fresh and you could actually see it. Uh, these are some that I called from um, articles of the time. And wherever possible, they tried to run the, um, the break along the ridges. But of course, that's impossible in the Sierra Nevada foothills it's deeply dissected by rivers. So in places, it plunges in the canyons, such as here. And then it, uh, they would build bridges across those rivers. Here it is up on one of the ridges. And the figures for the Ponderosa Way vary between 650 miles and 800. And I think the reason for that is wherever possible, they tried to use pre-existing roads. So um, I suspect that it, the um, CCC built about 650 miles and then linked up with these other roads. Now, this is the ideal situation for the fuel break because it, the land is relatively flat, which it isn't often 
in the uh, foothills. And here the, the way could actually expand out to 200 to 250 feet. Whereas in the steeper terrain, it would be about 50 feet. And wherever possible, they would actually dig it right down to bedrock. This made it easier to maintain it uh, over the long run because you wouldn't have the uh, brushes and the tree growing back at least so quickly. Now, after the war, something interesting happened because in 42, the CCC was um, put out of existence. All those men were off fighting. They had been trained in the camps for discipline and, and actually they made a great fighting force. They were in terrific shape. But something interesting happened to Ponderosa Way. After the war, nobody wanted it because there wasn't the labor force anymore to maintain it. A cheap labor force, I should say. So it started growing back and it became this kind of orphan um, that nobody really wanted to take responsibility for. This is Doug Laurie, um, who is in uh, Matthias's story, and he's a fascinating guy. Um, he uh, is a uh, former um, California Conservation Corps supervisor who, like me, has been acting as a kind of pesky mosquito to try to get his locality, in his case, He's up near Chico. In my case, I'm in Inverness on Point Reyes, trying to get the locals to realize the urgency of maintaining um, a fire break, both as a way of, of slowing or stopping the fire and as an emergency evacuation route. Um, unfortunately, Doug's documentation, of which apparently he had a lot, um, half of it burned when his apartment did when he was living in paradise. He barely got out with his life. He had a harrowing escape. His lungs were wrecked by the smoke that he breathed at that time, but he's now living in Chico and he's carrying on the good fight to, um, to um, remember and have the Ponderosa way saved for people um, who might otherwise be trapped in a little town called Cohasset up there. This was shot by a, uh, one of our associates down in Mariposa County. And you can see how it's nearly impassable in many places. In some places, it's disappearing altogether. The bridges that the seas built um, are in many cases in very bad condition or completely impassable like this one, which doesn't even have a deck. Some of them were made out of wood and they've either burned or been swept away in floods. In 2010, Professor Betty Elaine Smith, who's on this call actually, um, assigned a 57 mile stretch of the North Ponderosa Way to her uh, cartography class at Eastern Illinois University. And they confirmed what uh, Doug has said to me, that it's very difficult to even locate the Ponderosa Way, let alone to map it. It really is a chore. Now, this is a, um, a very interesting historical map, and it shows something um, that really caught my interest. Um, you can see that the Ponderosa Way parallels Highway 99 on the east side of the um, San Joaquin Valley going up the Sierra, but it, although it connects the, the national forest, it doesn't often touch them. So what this means is it's going not only through many counties, but over a lot of public, pro, uh, rather private property. So I'm, I still haven't um, dis, determined how they actually did this. They must have used eminent domain. And of course they didn't have to, um, uh, deal with environmental laws. They just built the thing. This might seem like it doesn't have anything with the Sierra Nevada, but in fact, actually it does. This is the Daniel Burnham plan for San Francisco in 1905. And in this plan, Daniel Burnham proposed a series of wide radial boulevards that would transect the existing grid of San Francisco. And they would not only serve to beautify the city and speed traffic in a modernized San Francisco, but also to serve as a fire break in case a fire ever broke out in this almost entirely wooden city, which it did the next year. And this is the aftermath of the great fire after the earthquake. And uh, what you can see is what happens to a largely wooden city, it disappears, except where there are masonry buildings downtown. Now this might seem like a great opportunity for realizing the Burnham plan with its radio boulevards, to act as fire breaks. But in fact, you are looking at why it couldn't happen. And that is the streets define property lines. And the property lines make a city very, very conservative. So um, they built back 
on the existing property lines and streets almost immediately after, by three years later, it was pretty much rebuilt without any of those um, fuel breaks that Burnham had proposed. Now, I like to think of, of these fuel breaks actually as, as fire levees. Um, and of course, what a levee is, is an embankment. Um, it should be uh, permanently maintained to protect the valuable property behind the levee. Because if you don't, in fact, um, you can lose a great deal of valuable property as well as lives. And that's what we're doing increasingly these days. The American Society of Civil Engineers every four years comes out with a report card of what's happening to um, American public, um, public works. Uh, so much of which was built 85 years ago during the New Deal. And they gave the, um, uh, they gave the levies in the United States this grade uh, D minus, I think it is, I can't see it actually. Um, and as it says, they're protecting over $1.3 trillion in property values. Um, actually, oh no, it was D. Um, actually, that's a little bit worse than the cumulative grade of all of our public works, which is D plus. Um, I went through all the various categories and they didn't grade the uh, fire breaks in the United States because that's not a category that they grade. But if they did, it would be down at the bottom, perhaps even an F, if the, the ponderous way is anything to judge by. Well, you might remember um, last year, the guy in the middle actually visited the town of Paradise, which he mispronounced. I'm not sure he knew exactly where he was. And there he is flanked by two of California's governors lecturing them about their responsibility for the fire that destroyed paradise. As he said, um, uh, it burned because we don't manage our forest. That is, we don't rake it like the Finns do of the, in their forests, um, which the Finns actually found quite baffling. So there were a lot of these um, photos of um, raking or vacuuming their forests. Of course, they have a, um, a climate which isn't exactly like California's. Um, well, this is actually uh, the, one of the reasons we don't manage our forests, but of course uh, the, the, the um, 45 wasn't going to mention this. It's because we don't have the money to do so because of the tax revolt started by Howard Jarvis in California, which is stanched funding for doing exactly that kind of work, which we must do. Now, I highly recommend this book by our associate, Bob Leininger. Um, the, Subtitle is The Forgotten Legacy of the New Deal. And you can't understand the New Deal agencies without reading Bob's book. But the, the actual title is Long Range Public Investment. And that's really telling because it's something we've largely forgot about, that the government must do public investment that the market won't do to protect the people. And of course, we're learning about that now with the pandemic. Um, back to the CCC. We desperately need the CCC. As I said, Roosevelt wanted to make it permanent, but it was killed um, actually just before his death during the um, Second World War, and it's never been revived, but we need it now. And there have actually been a number of legislators in Congress who have introduced bills to revive the Civilian Conservation Corps in the age of climate change. And I was delighted yesterday to hear that Biden has actually proposed a civilian climate core to do not only what the original CCC did, but actually to confront the challenge of climate change that they did not. But we don't have to wait that long because actually thanks to Jerry Brown the first, we have our own conservation core in the state, which he established in 1976 modeled on the original CCC. It's the oldest and largest and they do their work so well and so unobtrusively that many Californians aren't even aware that they exist, but they do and they do great work and it needs to be greatly expanded so that we can do the kind of work that we need to do to save ourselves because we're living in a very different age as Stephen is going to tell you about, but you don't have to listen to Steve, although I want you to because the Chronicle tells you all the time on front page stories and you are experiencing it all the time as in the last hellish summer that we went through. This was just a couple of days ago in the Chronicle the fire season is now year round in California, not just in California, but throughout the entire West because of the droughts and the climate change that we're having. 
So this is a day that I'd really not like to remember, but it's gonna be hard to forget, and I'm sure we won't. Um, probably most of you went through this. And the point is that planning and prevention is much cheaper than what we're experiencing now. And that is actually the point of long range public investment. Um, we not only have to uh, build and maintain fire breaks or rather fuel breaks like the Ponderosa Way, we need to build a lot more of them in places like Point Reyes, for example, but all throughout California and the West. This is the smoke from the Woodward Fire, um, which was in the center of the Point Reyes National Seashore. And again, this is something that I hope I never have to see again. But on that, I give you Stephen Pine. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Greg, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I was asked um, to speak very briefly about the general historical context for the Ponderosa Way and other, other uh, fire-related projects in the 1930s. I was also asked to explain how I got interested in fire, and it's very simple. A few days after I graduated from high school, I found myself on uh, a fire crew and uh, stayed with them for 15 seasons, 12 as crew boss. But I'd like to begin the story of uh, American Fire with the 1880 census, which improbably enough included a map of forest fires. And the darker the area, the, the larger the proportion of uh, area burnt each year. Uh, this is only forest fires. It didn't include grasslands. And it is, uh, in many ways, a very different map from what we see today. So what kinds of fires are involved? Well, we have nature's fires. Uh, lots of fires start by lightning. We have fires started by people. Uh, most of it historically has been for agriculture, uh, grazing, farming, land clearing of one kind or another. Uh, and in the 19th century, already by the 1880s, we, we begin to see the impact of industrialization, or in this case, an alternative form of burning that will begin to compete and then collude with the other kinds of fire. So this is really a map of the United States between three fires. And at the time, the US is much like uh, Brazil in recent years with similar kinds of fire issues. There were lots of bad burns. We're talking about monster fires, million acre fires, uh, fires candidable. Uh, we're talking about fire probably an order of magnitude in general from what we've seen recently. And this continued well into the 20th century and gave rise to uh, the realization that the state would have to intervene. And the progressive era was willing uh, to do that. Um, forests were a primary target, both for trees and for watershed. Began creating reserves, 1891, gave it an act, uh, 97, and then in 1905, gave it an organization to administer at the US Forest Service. However, unlikely, uh, <laughs> their task might seem. They had one fire guard for every 670 square miles. This was a global project, by the way, uh, practiced not only in the Northern Rockies, but in the central mountains of India. Uh, and this was the US was was doing what other uh, progressive and Western countries were at the time. Well, the foundation story for the American way of fire begins in 1910, August of 1910, the big blow up. Uh, over 5 million acres burned on the national forests. Nobody knows how much generally. About three and a quarter million acres were in the Northern Rockies. This is a map the Forest Service produced um, after the uh, season's fires. So it's roughly a little less than what California experienced this last year, but in a very concentrated form. Um, 78 firefighters were killed. Forest Service went in debt to over a million dollars, which was real money in 1910, and the whole generation was traumatized. They even mapped the smoke. So smoke is not something new. It's something that uh, disappeared and is now coming back. That same month in California, Northern California, uh, a counter proposal was launched, namely light burning. This had been simmering for some time. It finally went public 
the same time as the big blow up and suggested that the entire design of firefighting by the Forest Service was misguided, that we should be emulating the American Indian. And here we are uh, in the Plumas National Forest, again, back in the general area of paradise. So they were surveying the boundaries, noting that everybody is burning. They have picked up the tradition from uh, the indigenous peoples. They've come to think of the fire as a part of the forest and beneficial and all classes set, hold this view and all set fires. And this was something that was considered anathema on many levels by the forest service. And here's Aldo Leopold, the prophet of modern environmentalism in 1920, arguing against light burning and in favor of a forest service program of fire protection. So many of the controversies we're having today uh, have been around for more than a century. But partly because of the clash, the two opposing, these two alternative views uh, coming at exactly the same time, I don't think a, a reasonable debate couldn't evolve and people were forced to choose. And the Forest Service decided to double down uh, and eliminate fire as much as possible. Um, all of the future chiefs of the Forest Service were personally on the fire line. They were all young men. Uh, they were all uh, branded uh, by the experience. Uh, this was a kind of Valley Forge or Long March experience for the Forest Service that would continue um, until the outbreak of World War II. Congress uh, responded in 1911 with the Weeks Act and several successor acts since then uh, to create a national infrastructure for forestry that would be based on fire protection, federal state uh, programs. It took about 50 years for all the states to finally come on. Lots of innovation, lots of techniques to get to fires, to find fires, to invent technology, adapt technology, any of it uh, from California, by the way. But there was also the problem of what to do with the fires in these remote backcountry. You don't have access. It could take days just to get to a snag fire. In the early 30s, uh, the Dust Bowl had its counterpart with um, huge fires in the backcountry. Here's the Tillamook fire, 1933 uh, in Oregon. And you can see in the upper right an echo, another fire with a whole chain of these going on. Um, about 330, I think 360,000 acres burned. This is uh, uh, coastal Douglas fir. Um, and what to do with all of that abandoned backcountry, in a sense, backcountry in time, all that land had been cut over and burned and left. Well, what happened was the New Deal and an array of programs as, as Gray has laid out uh, to respond that thought that rehabilitating the social a crisis of the depression and rehabilitating America's environmental crisis were paired. And here's the CCC shortly after being organized, being sent out to fight the Tillamook fire. The CCC provided what the Forest Service had never had before. That is a standing body of people who could be rallied for fires. It's estimated that perhaps as much as half of what the CCC did was directly or indirectly involved with fire, a lot of it building roads, trails, uh, telephone lines, lookout towers, uh, warehouses, uh, fire caches, et cetera, and on. Where I worked, we still used, uh, the ranger station was an old CCC mess hall. We lived in old CCC housing. The CCC camp itself was, was had become our heliport. 1936, they built a fire cache for structural and uh, wildland fire. 40 years later, we took, retook the photo. That building is still in play. The buildings left there, uh, the roads, the lookout tower, all of those are still uh, present. A lot of resources. 1934, big fires break out again in the Northern Rockies. Chief Foresters Gus Silcox, he had been the number two man during the big blow up. Uh, he doesn't know what should they do with these fires. They had the CCC, they used them, but these big fires seemed to be too much. Uh, so he gathered uh, the best minds of the agency together. They met in Missoula, debated alternatives. And in 1935, he announced what became known as the 10 a.m. policy, a single universal standard to apply to every fire across the country, controlled by 10 o'clock the next morning. 
As a result of that, we got specialty fire crews, uh, the smoke jumpers by 1939, and evolving out of uh, the CCC, 40 man crews, self styled shock troops, the forerunner of the uh, hotshot crews of today. And we got massive infrastructure projects, as here, uh, a field break. Look at the number of people involved in the scale of the operation. But in some ways, it's also the case that the means became so large that they determined the ends. I can't imagine a 10 a.m. policy without the New Deal's political transfers available. We would have had to take a different route. Roosevelt was personally interested. Here he is reviewing a, a new fire prevention poster featuring Uncle Sam, who, by the way, looks suspiciously like the guy just to the right of the poster, who is the artist, <laughs> James Montgomery Flagg. And then it all goes to war. And World War II was in many ways a fire war. Uh, the US was attacked by Japanese fire bombs. And of course, it ends with a new fire weapon, the atomic bomb, your famous photo, army photo. But that is not the mushroom cloud of the atomic bomb. That is the pyrocumulus cloud of the burning city. So the military thought of that fire was now a, a question of national defense. The next wars would be fire wars. And so we began getting military interest uh, and we get a massive transfer of war surplus equipment and here in Southern California and staged photo in Northern California, replacing the muscle of the CCC with mechanical muscle and suggesting that you could continue the firefight without having quite so many men. We are in fact in a kind of cold war on fire and fire, well, it's the other red menace. Um, again, on uh, the war examples, uh, lots of efforts at large scale uh, mobilization of science, special equipment development centers created first to help convert uh, military equipment and then invent others. And then images like these, B-17s dropping fire retardant, uh, battle hardened crews uh, trudging along um, their trenches. But of course, this can't continue. For 50 years, the Forest Service had been a hegemon. It is a control and for all of the institutions involved. It had established policy and it had based that policy on a, a program of fire suppression. By the 60s, we began seeing uh, the blowback from that, the consequences. And re I remind you, this is all well before climate change comes on the horizon. And we'll see an institutional breakup and efforts to reorganize and lots and lots of experiments in fire policy. All of this, of course, occurs against a large environmental movement, a change in demography, uh, the creation of a civil society for fire and a redefinition of our public domain. What do we want those lands to be? And think of the Wilderness Act as perhaps the most um, dramatic version, but all of the federal agencies got new charters and in effect, that meant they would have to adapt fire programs accordingly. So we began a kind of revolutionary period, um, bipolar, uh, certainly by coastal Florida was one center looking at prescribed fire, deliberate burning, uh, looking at working landscapes, looking at private landscapes as well as public. California, more interested in wild landscapes, natural fire, and public lands. We also see the origins of a civil society that will be very important so, uh, in, in the evolving uh, structure and thinking. 1962, the Nature Conservancy conducts its first prescribed fire. Uh, TNC now burns as much each year as the National Park Service and Tall Timbers Research Station outside Tall Tallahassee, Florida begins a series of fire conferences um, that provide an alternative forum for thinking about fire. So the gist of the new programs. The Park Service changed 1968. The Forest Service 1978 was something called prescribed burn. It was an alternative, a middle ground between letting all fires go and trying to put them out. We would do the burning ourselves, directed by bureaucratic and scientific uh, constraints. That was then expanded, particularly out west, to something called a prescribed natural fire. Don't try to parse the metaphysics there but was a way of allowing natural fires more room uh, to run their extent. So think of it as the equivalent of reintroducing wolves. 
And even on wildfires, not having to put every fire out by 10 o'clock, there are lots of ways you can respond that are all considered control. So lots of, lots of choices here, which is great, except that people in the field have to make decisions very quickly and can't be expected to make decisions sort of on the fly. Well, the politics changes as in so many things within the 80s. Um, envir environmentalism is, um, uh, is attacked. Um, government uh, funding, government uh, programs uh, are, are, are set to be privatized and reduced and fire will bear all of this. So the progress stalls. It isn't eliminated, it just doesn't advance. In effect, we have a lost decade and a bit more. During that time, something quite unexpected happened that thanks to the character of urban sprawl, we begin seeing cities burn again. I mean, we hadn't seen cities burn since San Francisco. We fixed that problem. Watching towns burn again, going back to the late 19th century, that's like watching polio come back. What happened? We forgot to do all the things that took fire out of cities all the common boring hygiene, all of the simple things. Um, and so fire returns. The era ends with two uh, big uh, sort of explosions, extravagances, Yellowstone burns under nominally under a program of prescribed natural fire in 1988, about 40% of the park burns. And then Oakland burns over three, I think about 3,600 houses or something, 750 houses in the first hour. It's a new metric of fire behavior. How many houses per hour is consumed? And this was in 91. But this also means that we're seeing the landscape divide. It's polarizing like everything else. What we don't see here is the middle landscape, a middle working landscape. The emphasis is going to the two extremes. The revolution starts over with the Clinton administration, especially the interest of uh, Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt, who took a personal interest, and then in 94, uh, the South Canyon fire burned over uh, a crew in Colorado, and that uh, set into motion uh, efforts to have a common fire policy, a federal policy, to begin more seriously integrating all of the scatters, uh, scattered parts. Uh, by 98, Babbitt declares we're in a national fire crisis. In 2000, we have two major breakdowns. Wildfire returns to the Northern Rockies again. 90 years after the big blow up, we can't stop it. All those planes, all those helicopters, all those engines, all those crews, all those radios, all that science, we can't stop them. The National Park Service, meanwhile, set what I regard as an ill advised prescribed fire outside Bandelier National Monument that then escaped and burned into Los Alamos National Lab causing a, a crisis. So it seems we couldn't light fires or fight fires. And that results in the waning hours of the Clinton administration with a national fire plan. Not too little, too late, maybe too much, more than could be absorbed, but certainly too late. All the conditions that favor explosive fires are now, all the needles point in the same direction. We're getting larger fires, we're getting more communities burning, we're still losing firefighters. We have mega fires and now we have make it costs over half of the Forest Service entire budget is spent fighting fires. And the agency is, is simply being hollowed out and crippled by that effort. So what happens now? I think we're in perhaps inflecting into a new era. The revolution era, I think, may be fading. It's become part of our history. And we have to think about fire and our response to it in a somewhat different way. Maybe to use the uh, going term resilience. So we now have three strategies, uh, first two based on our history, we call a resistance strategy, reassert suppression, become an all hazard emergency service, model wildland fire on urban fire. And if you want an example of CAL FIRE, I mean, CAL FIRE is a very expensive way to do firefighting. Um, in fact, the entire California fire service is now um, under a kind of urban model. Uh, and that is something that, that has to be overcome if you want to change anything from suppression. But we have to do something to protect our communities. Um, and this is something that's politically very effective. 
and I don't mean political theater snidely, uh, you have to be shown to be doing something and calling for more airplanes and more engines and firefighters is a way of responding. But out of the fire revolution era, we also have a restoration strategy. Let's change the context of the fires to make it easier for us to set fires that don't blow up and to contain fires that we don't want. In other words, dampen the bad fires and promote the good fires. Encourage more robust landscapes. Now, with the added interest of climate change, and this can involve more than prescribed fire, we also have to harden our, our um, settlements. So the FireWise program for um, dealing with fires that are going to happen because we can control all these fires except the ones that are really large and bad. But those are the ones we need. In some ways, the strategy fails exactly when we most need it. And finally, this kind of resilient strategy, I see a lot among actual people on the ground, fire officers, we're not gonna get ahead of this problem. It's too late. The last chance we had was in the 70s and 80s. Since then, it's gotten harder and harder. They accept the conditions. They're going to work with fires. They'll provide asset protection around communities, municipal watersheds. Otherwise, they're liable to back off a couple of ridge tops and burn out. We're talking about very large burnout conditions, not emergency backfires. This is a kind of prescribed fire done under urgent conditions at a large scale. And that seems to be, we can get some fraction of good fire, maybe all that burnout Maybe 20% of 15, 20% of it was really more severe than we want, but we still got 80%, 75, 80, 85% of it within a range of quote, good fire. This may be what we have instead of prescribed fire, which is just too encumbered and too small scale to operate. This is very effective. Northern Rockies is using it. Uh, uh, Southwest is using it very effectively. Uh, parts of California are back behind uh, the coast range. Uh, so they're all in play. And which one should win? Well, it's a game of rock, scissors, paper. What does the particular circumstance require? It's very, if you're right along the edge of the LA basin or you know, San Francisco Bay Area, there's no alternative but all out suppression, whether you can be effective or not. Uh, but lots of other things, we need a mixture of stuff. And finally, what about climate change? Well, my sense is that we've got two realms of combustion colliding. How many of these fires are set by power lines under absolutely the worst conditions? There's another infrastructure project that uh, needs to be badly upgraded. But here we have one set of, of energy from burning fossil fuels interacting with uh, a fire prone landscape in very unhealthy ways. You add up all of our fire practices, and I think we're creating the fire equivalent of an ice age, or what I've taken to calling a pyrocene. Into the future, I'm reminded of the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, who thundered, they shall go out from one fire and another fire shall devour them. We will always be caught between fires. That's the world we live in. Fire does not have a fix, except in, uh, clearly built landscapes. Beyond that, we are always going to have to navigate and negotiate. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that great presentation. Thanks to both of you. And also I want to do a shout out to Matthias Gaffney, who wrote the article uh, in the Chronicle. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, this, the article that you, that you put together uh, inspired me to put this program uh, together for Mechanics Institute. It, it's, and I want to recommend everyone, please pick it up or look at it online. There was another article, I'm going to start with a question to both of you. Uh, another article um, in the Chronicle that was also addressing the issue of the private fire companies. And I wanted to get your feedback on some of those issues of, of, of private companies coming in into the, the whole picture of, and if that's positive or negative, or if it's a conflict of interest in terms of CAL FIRE and the whole effort to, to contain our fires. Um, Stephen, do you want to start off? 
Well, I mean, it's like many things. It's comparable to private security services. It's the wealthy providing their own uh, array of services uh, instead of contributing, in a sense, to public services. So it's like having private schools uh, and charter schools that, in effect, take away from the public. We're, it's, a, it's another form of privatizing. And uh, there was a lot of argument uh, during the 80s that privatization would make fire, uh, fire management more economical uh, and more uh, efficient. Uh, and I don't see any evidence for that um, because what you've done is create uh, a lobby group uh, for fire suppression. In fact, there's a national association of, of wildfire, I'm sorry, I can't get the exact term, but um, for crews, planes, uh, equipment and so forth. So it's another example we have to choose what's the balance between public and private. And for the past few decades, it has certainly been on the to the private side. Yeah, um, Laura, I will say that, you know, from my own experience, what, what I've been um, sort of startled by is in my own town, the uh, reluctance to take collective action to the community, um, because it seems like we're all on our own. We, you know, uh, the the approach being taken um, in Inverness and other towns as well too is kind of Dodge City. You're on your own, so you know you fire harden your house and you create a defensible perimeter around it. But what worries me, and Stephen could talk about this, is what happens when you get one of these monster wind-driven fires. Um, you know. Um, how safe are any of us going to be on our own? If I, if I could pile in his, I mean, there, there are many ways in which fire is a contagion phenomenon. You can model it exactly the same. So hardening houses is very much like wearing masks. And uh, defensible space around structures is very much like social distancing. Mm -hmm. And then if you can get a community response, you have the equivalent of herd immunity. Mm -hmm. But as long, if you take action and your neighbors don't, you're still vulnerable. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. We have some questions on the side and Pam Troy, our events assistant, will read off a few of these questions to you. Okay, the, the first one is from Betty Smith. Europe has their utilities all underground. Is there hope for that to be done in the United States? Um, well, yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, I think there are selectively areas. We know areas where wind comes and it's there. We have the fire equivalent of floodplains and it would make a lot of sense to put utility lines underground for those areas. Uh, otherwise, having a smart grid where you can reroute the power, having locally uh, sourced and uh, stored power means that you can go off grid for a few days. The winds don't go on forever. We're talking about two or three days. Um, there are a lot of things that we've talked about anyway as part of upgrading our energy profile and fixing a very creaky infrastructure and fire could be a part of it. Um, no, and, um, no, go ahead, Greg. Well, I, that's a good example again of, you know, what the American Society of Civil Engineers is saying. And that we, our public infrastructure is really falling into ruin. And um, we've left it up to private companies like PG&E. Um, and, you know, burying the, the infrastructure is obviously going to be very expensive and will probably require public investment very much like uh, during the Rural Electrification Agency, a government agency brought power to, um, to farms and rural areas at public expense. So I think we need to have a program like that. Uh, the next question is from Andrew Johnson for Dr. Pine. Where do fuel breaks fit into your framework of resistance and resilience? Do you think that 800 mile fuel breaks still have a place in our fire management strategies? Well, that's a tough question. Um, first of all, the difference between fuel breaks and fire break. A fire break, it goes all the way down to mineral soil. So it has no fuel within it. But these tend to be very small, they, short roads or or something scraped by hand. A fuel break is a reduction in fuels that changes the character of burning in the areas but does not eliminate it. So in something like the Ponderosa Way, you would have a fire break or road within the middle 
of, of the fuel break. Um, there are places for it. Um, I think you, I, I tend to be skeptical, um, partly because it's a, it's a question of design and then a question of maintenance. And the design is that like all design things, it works best if it's built in at the beginning, not if it's tried, you try to retrofit it on rugged terrain and so forth. Uh, it works in plantations. Uh, sugarcane is burned just prior to harvest. So there's a whole elaborate system of fuel breaks in sugarcane plantations. To do it. That works very well. It's much harder in a wildland setting. And then the maintenance issue, um, fire doesn't seem to be enough to maintain it. There's got to be something else. Uh, two effective fuel breaks in California, the international fuel break along the border with Mexico, uh, that is maintained not just for fire, but, but for border traffic. Uh, so it has dual purpose and has multiple funding. Camp Pendleton uh, is, I mean, it's just a network of fuel breaks inside and out because there's so much live fire um, training going on that it's constantly burning and it's very successful, but that's built in and there are other reasons for maintaining it. The problem is that fuel breaks have been elaborate. I mean, after the 1970 fires, they were all over Southern California, all the mountains had fuel breaks running along them and then they go away. Uh, and environmentalists uh, have begun to crit critique it because they can become um, an entry point for exotic grasses. Um, it, it's very hard. There has to be a high, there has to be high value. It has to be designed well so that it actually works. And then there has to be enough reasons for maintaining. And in a place like Paradise, I could imagine not so much a fuel break, but a large green belt, a recreational area. Uh, maybe we could get the Trump Organization interested in a golf course or something like that where you provide a large area that could absorb some of the, uh, a lot of the embers provided. But it has to, in my experience, it has to have another set of reasons or you won't get the funding. I mean, that's where Agent Orange was apparently developed. It was used to help maintain field breaks. And then based on that, it was sent uh, over to Vietnam for large scale defoliation. So why would you use something like that? Because you don't have a hundred camps of CCC boys to clean it out. Uh, the next question is from um, for Gray, it's from Peter Tannen. What was the origin of the name Ponderosa Way Firebreak? Gray? Oh, well, that's because the um, the dominant timber in the upper levels that it, the the Ponderosa Way was supposed to protect were Ponderosa Pines, so it gave its name the break even though it doesn't run through the Ponderosa Pines most of the way. It's really kind of, it, it tends to run through chaparral country. So uh, another, I have a question from Bernie Choden, or rather a, a kind of a question. What's the culpability of land use planning and planners in the approval of subdivisions in high fire risk areas? Hey, Gray, you can do this one. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's pretty high. Um, living in the, um, I, I used to think it was really stupid for people to move into the, um, what's it called, the, um, the wildland interface until I did it myself. Um, so, um, but I, I look around and I see that, you know, they keep permitting houses on Inverness Ridge, and it's not nearly as bad as some other places in the state um, where the subdivisions are just running wild. But in our case, actually, we're running out of water because um, we don't have any reservoirs. We, uh, our water supply is just from the springs that we have. So we have a problem with water as well as with fire. So I think that that is a major problem. But again, that goes back to Proposition 13 because Communities are strapped for funding, and you get the funding by developing the land. Um, but it's just not a very good formula when you have a fire coming over the hill or up the slope. I would I would add to that that um, I would add to that. So many of these communities are are not thought of as urban. 
uh, the wildland urban interface was defined by the urban, excuse me, was defined by the wildland fire community, which saw their job being complicated by houses. But it could as easily and more profitably been defined as an urban fire problem with funny landscaping. And if you define it as an urban fire problem, it's pretty clear what you have to do in terms of fire code, zoning, and the rest of it to make, make to protect these areas from fire. Mm -hmm. If you keep defining it as a, as a wildland problem, then it's very complicated. But Americans don't like to be told they can't build where and how they want. I mean, we do it in floodplains, we do it in coastal areas. We, we, we don't have special standards for hurricane areas. Uh, for you know, for tornado areas, uh, California has some standards for earthquakes, but it's really pretty tough. So the next question is from Kurt. Are there effective ways of maintaining forests like brush removal and thinning? Is that realistic? Well, actually, that's what I was going to ask Stephen because um, yeah. in the forest where I'm living, the, there's been fire suppression for so many decades that the fuel load is colossal. So you can't possibly have a preventive fire in something like that. Um, what would you recommend? Because, um, another example would be Mount Tamalpais, which looks to me like a nuclear weapon ready to go off at any moment. And of course, it's just <laughs> covered. The lower parts of it are covered with houses. So how do you recommend that a situation like that be rectified? You know, I think, well, different treatments are needed in different areas, and they're all going to be site-specific, but you, you can have a cocktail of treatments. In fact, instead of fuel breaks, I would put crews to work over a broad area of thinning and making that land ready to accept fire at what, whatever its national, natural or uh, suitable regime is. And that's the maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, we will always have to do some continual thinning. I think of it as a kind of weedy wooding. Woody weeding, excuse me, it's getting light for me. Um, but I think fire will be the, the primary way of doing it uh, over much of the landscape. We're simply not going to be able to uh, rake or, or do things. By the way, Europeans did rake their forests uh, in the 19th and 18th century, but they did it to scrape out more fuel to put on their fields so they could burn them. The fallow was, where the fallow wasn't adequate, they would begin thinning tree limbs, raking up pine yields and the rest. They were trying to get more fire. They just wanted it in a different place. So um, Nathan Sayer asks, what role could livestock grazing, grazing play in the fire policy today? Well, I think there's a place for prescribed grazing just as there is for prescribed burning. And I can even imagine in very selective areas uh, prescribed logging around certain communities. Uh, the problem with all of these projects is that they don't economically pay for themselves. They have to be subsidized. Um, which is the problem, which is why, which is why they were you know, cut out and grazed out and then abandoned uh, before. Uh, the market, I, I see little evidence that the market will resolve that. Uh, you have to move the animals around, but, but we are getting an economic return. It's not that it's all just you know, money given out for stuff. You, you have to subsidize it. But hey, how much of the Midwest agriculture do we subsidize? <laughs> Why can't we subsidize some of the Western forests in this way? I'm very pro-goat myself. And um... As I understand, it, the East Bay Regional Park District and UC actually use goats up in the hills to, to create a, a, a band of um, low fuel up there. And one of the great things about goats is that they love poison oak. Um, and yeah. so I'm all for that. One of the accounts I ran into about the building the Ponderosa Way is how much the boys suffered because they had to cut this thing through an area of rich poison oak groves. And so they suffered terribly from that, as well as from sunburn. Remember, that is pre-sunblock um, at that time. And they were, they were working um, with no shirts on at the time. Probably no, well, they, I think they had hats, but that's it. This was incredibly hard work that they were doing. And they did it magnificently. So um, 
the next question is uh, Jordy Lynch. Are there programs being developed to raise enough money for dealing with fires nationally? Taxation is unpopular, but surely homeowners are concerned about their security and incentives can be created to finance fire maintenance. <laughs> well, uh, the system we've had isn't working. Uh, Congress, as a result of, actually there was an act in 1908 that allowed the Forest Service to overspend its budget in the case of fires because you could never predict how much fire would come for the, for the budgetary year. And they were spending something like 30 or $40,000 over budget. 1910, they went a million dollars. So suddenly this was real money and Congress supported that. And so set up a system of kind of emergency funding for fires when you're actually on fires, which made it possible to engage in large fire campaign fires. Congress then changed the methods uh, in the early aughts and uh, the Forest Service is having to pay for everything out of its uh, appropriated budget, which stripped it. And now it's, it's spending roughly 50% or more of its entire budget. That's science, uh, trail maintenance, campgrounds, recreation, watershed, grazing, anything. It's all being sucked into fire. And this has gone on for a long time. Congress has tried uh, several several moves, uh, but then never came up with the money to make it work. Uh, there is a new one, uh, I think a year ago, and I'm hopeful that maybe with the change of administration as well, uh, that could stick. Because we're spending all this money fighting fires, not doing thinning, not doing prescribed burning, not, not doing anything else. There's a question. And there's not... There I'm oh, sorry. sorry, and there's not much evidence, by the way. People are always wondering, well, shouldn't wouldn't the insurance company come in? Insurance provide, you know, incentives. No, they'll just leave. I mean, I, I don't see an alternative. That's what happened in cities. I mean, you had to have a political solution, and then the insurance companies could operate within boundaries. I have a question from Betty Smith. These mega fires are occurring around the world, Australia, Europe, South America, for Stephen. Is there any international coordination among policymakers and foresters internationally? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion. And in fact, uh, we, we actually have treaties uh, with, with Mexico and Canada to exchange firefighters. We also have a treaty with Russia, which we aren't going to be using anytime soon. Uh, but that was put into place uh, in the 90s. Uh, and there are other USAID uh, sends, help, sends help when asked. Uh, there's quite a lot. The Europeans are putting together uh, programs. Uh, there are uh, there are assistance, but there are many kinds of fires that alarm people, and not all of them are wildfires like we see in California. For example, uh, the fires in Brazil are not really wildfires. These are land clearing fires. The fires in Indonesia in peat. These are land clearing fires to convert for palm oil plantations. These are not really wildland fires. Why, why would we send hotshot crews and air tankers there? I mean, it happens because you wanna show, yeah, we're fighting the fires, but this is not about fires that need to be fought and suppressed. They, it's the political economic circumstances that are driving these fires. So th they're very different. Um, the, the, one of the most blasted areas in the world is the su southern Europe along the Mediterranean. Portugal, I mean, it's just no place. Hectare for hectare has been pounded as bad as Portugal. Greece is almost as bad, but there it's also a problem of social disorganization, uh, lack of institutions, the collapse in the economy uh, that they've undergone. Uh, and in, interestingly, in, in those areas, it's also the reverse of the problem we have in the American West, which is to say that it's land abandonment. You have people leaving their traditional farming, going to the cities, the land is overgrowing. And now it's becoming very susceptible to fires. <laughs> so they're talking about how do we recolonize the rural landscape with a kind of rural form in a way that will allow us to contain the fire. So grazing would have a lot to do with that. Uh, orchards would have a lot to do with that, other kinds of things. Great. 
Well, we've come to the end of our time, folks, and I want to thank Gray Brecken and Stephen Pine for this really informative uh, discussion and presentation. Just to have this view of our, the issues of fire containment preservation on both the local level, California state level, the national level, and also international. Um, and I and I know that we'll be looking, you know, both at our at our news and also to see how that how we can move forward some legislation and perhaps more funding towards this Im important crisis that we're in, um, especially here in California. And um, yes, we will have this program on our YouTube channel uh, in in about a week or so. So please, if you want to review it again, you can come back and and see the program again. And uh, again, you can buy books by both authors at your local independent bookstore or online, alexanderbook.com. And we want to thank you again for a great presentation and join us again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. So if yeah, thanks to Matthias for that great article, by the way. Yeah. I, he's still on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Herb. Thank you. We can all unmute and say bye if you'd like. Just it's good good seeing everybody. Thank you so much. This is everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. It was incredible. Bye. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the, close the doors now. It's great seeing everybody. Thank you again, Gray and, and Stephen. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephen.